Okay? Yeah, so algorithms, right? Nothing can be easier. We took an algorithms class before, right? How many people took an algorithms class before now? An undergraduate? Only, only five people? Okay, that's nice. Um, so what is this class about? I mean, we, we know a little bit how that goes, right? A little bit of pseudo code, and maybe you guys are gonna have uh, one or two programming assignments, but mostly it's gonna be on paper. Um, like the, of course, what we wanna do here is to figure out how computers think, right? Th that's, that's what everybody hears, right? Algorithms, how computers can think. Um, that's all very good. We all know that's necessary, that computers must think somehow. What is not obvious for students taking algorithms, we have to figure out how we think, right? That's not, not an obvious thing. We, are we thinking for computers to think good, correct, implement, do stuff? We have to figure out that first because computers can only do what we tell them to do. We're still waiting for that big moment of you know, big breakthrough AI or machines take over. That didn't happen yet. So until that happens, computers can only do what we tell them to do. So if we do not think right, nor will computers, okay? Because computers can be much faster than we are at certain things, but they can only do what we program them to do. How many times you look at the computer and you thought there's something wrong with the computer because you couldn't understand what it did, right? Oh, my, there's gotta be a virus here. Oh, maybe the CPU is buggy, something. But in fact, what was the problem? We didn't tell the computer what to do correctly, right? So, uh, before I move in, um, it's important to understand this. In, in this class, the most important thing, most important <coughs> outcome, if you like, is that we think correctly. And then you're gonna have plenty of time, even after this class, to figure out how to implement that thinking in the computer. That's very important, of course. That, that's, that's core computer science. You gotta be able to translate your thinking into a program. But the basics of this class, and what's absolutely fundamental for you as, as, as not just computer scientists, but the scientists and engineers, is that you think right first. Um, so let me uh, talk about a few things as an introduction. Um, and then I'll, I'll put up the, my laptop here, and I'll show you guys if we can figure out the project and everything. Uh, where the website is and how the class is going to go and assignments and exams and all that. Right? Um, so let me start with a little bit of a, of a puzzle. Right? Suppose four people went across the river. Okay? And uh, those four people, here's the river. So I have four people. They want to cross from here. So the four people have crossing times. Some of them are faster, some of them are slower. So suppose the crossing times are this, one, two, nine, ten. People in the back can see this? So those people can want to cross the river on the other side, obviously. They can only do it with a flashlight. There's a flashlight, right? So to cross the river, either way, you need a flashlight. It's night, dark, they're scared, they need a flashlight, right? And when they cross with a flashlight, one or two people can cross at once. Right? So initially the flashlight is here, and somebody has to cross, or maybe two people can cross, one or two. But then for these ones to cross, they, somebody needs to return the flashlight. And every time there is a cross, the time to cross will be which one? If two people cross, of course, if this person crosses, how long is it going to take to cross? Two minutes. But if the two and ten cross, how long is it going to take to cross? Ten minutes, right? Because they cross together hand in hand, so to speak. So what's the minimum time to move those four people on the other side together, total time? That is, I have to count the flashlight going this way maybe two people, and then coming back, and then going again, and coming back, 
and going again, and I'm asking, what's the minimum time that I get all four on the other side? 25. The minimum time, by the way, is a unique number, right? Because you guys already said three things. So it can't be all three, right? It's got to be one of them. Minimum, it's got to be just one minimum. 24? 23, I heard. It's like in actions. 23, anybody smaller than 23? 23? Anything smaller? 23? You know what we need to figure out here? Are you guys all registered to my section, really? I mean, I think there's got to be some people that are not registered. That's fine. As long as there's seats in the room, we got to figure out a way to move people more forward, if that's possible. I don't know. I mean, um, you don't have to do this right now, but for future classes, if you want to take your chair and move forward because it's too far in the back, that's totally fine with me, as long as people can take notes. So 23? Anybody smaller than 23? Because we're looking for minimum. So somebody with 23, who said 23, hands up. Okay, how do I get 23? What's, what's the, the, now I'm writing down the procedure, right? How do I get to 23? Who crosses first? So one has to accompany two, nine, and 10 for each time? Hold on, hold on. Cross by cross. What's the first cross? Uh, let's say one and two. So the first cross, he's proposing one and two cross here. Mm -hmm. And then I have on the other side, uh, nine, ten. Right. So that's the first cross. He passed one, two this way. The time to, how much time it took to do that, to move one and two? Two. Then? One has to go back. One is to move back, so I get one, nine, ten here, right? And then two, so one move this way. How long did that take? One. All right. Then? You repeat this for nine and ten, that's it. What? Who moves? Nine. 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 Only one person moves? One, one, one and nine. nine. One and nine. So then I get one, two, and nine, nine. here, and then ten here, right? Mm -hmm. And nine. then how long did that take? Nine. nine. Okay. And now what? One goes back again. One goes back. One and ten. And then I'm left here two and nine, right? How long did that take? One. And then? One and, one and ten. One, two, nine, ten, right? Yeah. How long did that take? Ten. Yeah. Ten. ten. So the total is? Twenty-three. Twenty-three. Or oh, you can take less also. Seventeen. You can take less? Oh, let's see. Okay, so maybe twenty-three is not the minimum. Let's see. Who crosses first? One and two, they cross first. Okay, so one, two here, and nine, ten here. Yeah, and That then will then take? Two. 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 Then one comes back. One comes back. One, nine, ten. Now nine and ten cross together. So that's, hold on. You two pass for me. One. <laughs> yeah, that big one. All right. Nine and ten cross here. Right, you it say? Nine and ten cross together, that takes ten. Okay, so I get nine, ten, and two, and here's the one, right? Yeah. And that took nine and ten cross, so. Ten. Ten. And then? Two comes back. Two comes back. Okay. Then, so that takes? Two. Two. And then? One and two go together. Nine, ten. So that will take? Two. two. How much is this? Seven yeah, I think that's the minimum. So, very good. Simple exercise. But there is a core idea here. In this, in this whole thing, something core idea happened. Why is this better? What's the fundamental moment that makes this approach better? There's one step in here that's critical that all the other approaches that don't have this, this, this step in here will take less time. What is that fundamental step? Nine and 10. Nine and 10 going together. Because when nine and 10 go together, those are the big ones. This will take a lot of time to go. If they go together, that big time happens only once. All the other crosses are not that big. There's only one big cross that's necessary because 10 has to go at some point. But it's only one big cross because 9 and 10 go together. And any other cross, see all the other crosses are small. Any approach that doesn't take 9 and 10 together will have to take them separately. 
separately means I'm going to have a 10 and a 9 plus the additional small crosses. That's going to be bigger. So it's this kind of thinking that that's a core idea, but you have has to be wrapped up in some sort of procedure, right? If you hit a problem, you have to identify this internal core mechanism that makes it work, and then you have to okay expand that to an algorithmic procedure like dynamic programming or linear programming or greedy or, or graphs algorithms, whatever it is that we do. So it's important to know the procedural algorithms. If somebody says depth first search, or, 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 or you need it, or you know, you need, you need Dijkstra algorithm, you need to know how that works. But besides, that's not enough. Knowing all this collection of things, like Dijkstra algorithm and DFS and dynamic programming, all that, is not enough because you have to go to the core idea of the problem and figure out how to solve it. In this small example, that core idea is that 9 and 10 has to go together to minimize the time. Of course, you still need a procedure for how to do that. Um, so, okay, cool. We've seen some examples where, where thinking matters. And I, I have another one uh, that's at the end of my slides here, but I can do it now. That's a, an interview, I think, a few years ago from Facebook question. Um, do we all know how linked lists look like? Yes. Mm -hmm. So a linked list looks like this. Right? As a representation um, Typically, this is a chunk of memory Some sort of object And it has a pointer to another chunk of memory That's some other object, right? That's how we represent things But visually, we can represent it this way This is called the head, right? So it's called head A here And that's the address I start and typically with lists, everything I do, I have to start from here. With lists, there is no way to start in the middle or in the back because the only way to traverse it is to go by those pointers. Now, suppose I have two lists. And uh, so I have two lists, H, A, and H, B. Usually lists are marked by the, by the head of each list. And it is known that they intersect. So somebody, God comes down to earth and says, those two lists intersect. Okay? You don't have to verify that. It's a known thing. Right? Known thing meaning if you go from HN from HB, at some point, you're going to hit the same object. That's what intersect means. And uh, the way I can tell this uh, because I can compare if, if I'm if I'm in some some nodes for each list. Suppose in this list I'm in, I'm in node X and this other list I'm in node Y. I can ask. So I'm going to say here aloud. Ask is X equal to Y. So every time I'm I'm in, in I have an object here. I have another object. I can ask is X and Y the same thing? And if they are means I've, I've got myself in an intersection, maybe. Right? So the problem that Facebook used as an interview a few years ago was you get two lists, you know they intersect, you have to find the intersection. You have to find this point where the two lists combine together. How would you do that? That's a little bit more algorithmic than this one. This one is pure puzzle thinking. That has to do with a little bit of structures of the lists. So how is it that we're going to find this part here? Again, in the computer sciences, we have to start from the headers on each of them and advance in those lists. And every once in a while, ask the question, is that equal to that? And when they are, you know they're equal, but you have to find this part. Like, you might be here, and you may ask, is x equal to y? And they might be the same. But you want the, the first one, this point where they first invested. This is what we want. So the task is find intersection. Yes? Uh, we can traverse one list and start saving all the nodes in a set. Till the yeah, inner lookup table, and then another list we can check if that node was available there. So that. Um, method that we're going to talk about for a race to lookup kind of things 
implies that we have to store these elements in some sort of hash table, right? Yeah. Right? Well, that's not, you, that's, that requires a little bit of mechanism. It's easy to say store things up in a hash and check them later on. But that has to, that's more complicated. It's a good idea. It's more complicated than people think because storing things in a hash requires hashing. It, we have to be aware of what is it that we're storing, like memory addresses. How do we store memory addresses, so on and so forth. And then when you say, check it out, I think his, his method is, if I store this list in, in, a, in a hash, when I traverse the other list, when I'm seeing some nodes here, I'm going to ask, is that node X in my set that I stored? Well, how, comp how, how hard is that question? I have a set of objects, say the first list. Then I pick another object from the second list, and I ask, is this object in my set? How long would that take? How, how do we implement that question? Is this node in my set? We we'll, uh, store the references maybe, of, of an object. So the naive way I'm aware of is to say, suppose I store the first list in my set, like he's proposing, or in a hash. Then I get this x. How would I know if x is in the hash? I can check x against every one of these nodes. Say, is x equal the first one I stored? Yes or no. Is x equal the second one I stored? Yes or no. Is x equal the third one I stored? Yes or no. In this part, if this is the x, this particular node, the answer will be no, 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 no. Right? But then, how long is it going to take to check an object? If, say, this list is of size m, I'm going to say the list here is m, and this other list, uh, so how much is m? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, right? And the list, the other list has size n, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. If I do what he's proposing, this storage, the first list, will have seven objects, and then for each one of them I'll have to check, right? Check for each one of them, check for each one of them, until I get to this one, and I check, 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 bingo, I get it, right? What? I, will, I don't want to say running time yet, but how many steps, how many checks do I have to do on average? That's probably something like n times n. I'm not going to do all of them because at some point I'm going to find the intersection. But if that intersection is roughly in the middle, maybe I do half of them. Right? How many people follow me here? If I start storing the first list in some data structure, like a hash or table or array, and then I go by the second list, check this against everybody. That's M checks, right? <laughs> check this against everybody, another M checks. Check this against everybody, M checks. So roughly, if I follow this method, I'll have n times n checks until I found the intersection. I'm not going to do all of them, because at some point, I'm going to be like, OK, I, I found it. Hands up so I can see them. How many people follow this mechanism? OK. So n times n. For n times n, I probably don't need to store anything. I could just start in here, start in here with two pointers, right? Check if they are different, do what? Advance which one? A. Can I advance both? No. Why not? Because then you will miss the previous element of A. Suppose they don't equal and I advance both. Check again. Right? What happens? You not equal. I advance both. Check again. What happens? Not equal. Advance both. What happens now when I advance both of them? This one here goes where? Here. And this one goes? Check again. Not equal. Not equal. I advance, advance, advance. Not this equal. way wouldn't work because I miss the intersection that way, right? You see, not equal, not equal, not equal. But it'll be very fast, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, this will be extremely fast to go down to the end. But I'm missing the point. Hmm. Uh, so, okay, so advance one of them. What you say? <clears throat> advance one of them, check. And now, after I advance one of them, they are different. What do I do? Which one? Both? Okay, check again. Advance, 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 check, check, check. That's M checks. And now that I'm at the very end, what do I do? You come back. To come back and advance this one. Yes. Check, check, check. That's still M times N. It just keeps the part to store everything in a hash. 
So it's a little bit better than that one, but the critical part, which is the running time, it's still n times n checks until we find it. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, if you are storing the previous pointer, and then consecutively checking both the points. Yeah, so, so check, not equal. Forward. Both of them? Yeah. And then I'm storing the previous pointer. You store those two, both of them? Uh, only the first one. Only this? Yeah. And now? Uh, and now again I'll go forward and I'll put a check on the So center. now we check these two or these two? No, uh, we will move forward and from the uh, the second one, I'll check the previously stored one, whether they are matching. So by the time you're here, you have to check this, this and this, all three of them? Uh, no, I'll be storing only the previous one. Only this? Yeah. But then what if I, how about this? Uh, so, by the time I advance here, mm -hmm. do I have to check this one against all previous ones? No, no. only like when I'll be going forward after this. The next step. If so, in here I check both of them, they're not equal, right? Right. I store the, you see, store this pointer mm -hmm. you mean, right. in some data structure. Mm -hmm. Advance both of them, you say check x against the previous pointer, right. check x against these two. Okay. Okay, so I check, I do two checks here. Yes. Then they don't match, so I advance. Right. Now this, let's call this x2. This x2 have to be checked against this, this right. and against this. Right. So that's still n times n, roughly, because this will be checked against everybody until you find intersection, more or less. And the difference between the length of the list, uh, skip those many. Uh, okay, the difference is you mean n, n minus, minus n, n, n one? Yes. Uh, so minus one? Yeah. Uh, skip that many nodes from the longer list, and then at once. Bingo. That's the one. Okay. What he's saying, I could do what I propose, check, 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 advance both of them, if I somehow start by knowing that I'm gonna get to the intersection. The problem is, in here, this guy has how many steps to the intersection? Two, and this guy has three. If I know that difference, which is the same as the difference in the size of the list, right? If this list has size 7 and this other list has size 8, what he is saying, find the difference, which is 1. And in the longer list, don't start in here. First, get rid of that difference 1. In this list, start from here. Because that way now, if I advance both of them, they're going to reach the intersection at the same time. The reason I have 8 minus 7 equal 1 is that if I advance 1 in the longer list, which is the bottom one, now, if I do what we said as a second procedure, right? Advance, advance, I'm going to find the intersections. So I could do this, which is very fast. How long is it going to take me to find that inter the difference in the beginning, that pre-processing step to allow me to do this? N plus N, right? So it's still good. It's not N times N. It's N plus N because I traverse the first list. I count it. I get M or N. And then the other one. That's the right answer here. Okay. So while this is a, a little bit of computer science, more than this, it still comes down to an essential thinking question. The, the trick here, why Facebook used it as an interview question, was to test people thinking. Do you, do you find the core mechanism idea? In here, the core was 9 and 10 have to go together. That's what solves the problem. In here, what is the core idea that allows us to solve this well? that you need to find the difference and take the difference out. And if you now start with the difference offset out, you can very easily get to the intersection by advancing both lists. Right? So that, that, that idea, of course, you still have to write a program, say, we'll code, wrap it up, but that's not too hard in this case. The, the hard part is finding that idea that solves the problem efficiently. All right? Good. So, we started to learn how to think. I'm going to move a little bit towards uh, more computer science thingies. And uh, I think we have up to, let me put my clock here because I can't trust those, those clocks in different rooms. Um, we have until 11.30, right? my time here.
All right. Um, here's what I want to talk to you about. Uh, an another problem. Uh, in, a, in the beginning of this course, we're going to start with a combination of mathematics, simple mathematics, and computer science, because that's where algorithms really start, in combining a little bit of mathematical knowledge with what computers can do. And the more we advance, we may hit much more algorithmic things. Eventually, occasionally, we're also going to hit some mathematical things. Um, so here I want to show you something called Fibonacci numbers. Um, I'm going to describe them mathematically at first. Perhaps some of you heard of this Fibonacci numbers? Anybody? Hands up. Who heard of them? Okay. They, they're very simple. It's high school level stuff. Uh, I could have described Fibonacci numbers from a very, very computer science perspective. But I prefer to introduce them mathematically and then I'll show you how I could have done it with computer science. So uh, Fibonacci numbers are F0 equals 0, F1 equal 1. F2 equal 1, F3 equal, the rule is here we add the previous two, right? That's how Fibonacci works. So this one will be what? 2, F4 is 3, F5 is 5, five. F6 is 8, 7 is 8, F8 is 21, okay, and so on and so forth, right? So as a definition mathematically, we have F0 equals 0, F1 equal 1, that's called a base, base case, base recurrence, base something, that's how we start. And then we have Fn plus 1 is Fn plus Fn minus 1 for any n starting at 1. This is called a recurrence. It's called a recurrence mathematically because it's defined on itself. If I only give you the recurrence, you couldn't tell what those numbers are because the definition of every number relates to the previous numbers. Now, of course, if I give you a base, you can go by the recurrence and find out all the numbers. So uh, suppose I want to compute Fibonacci numbers. So you get a simple task, naively, compute f of n. Right? That, that's a task, and I'm a computer scientist, a very good one, and I'm going to write this program right now. Now, when I say program in this class, I typically mean pseudo code, which is this language we use to describe the programs on paper. And typically, you can take a pseudo code and implement it in whatever programming language I want to. Right? But pseudo code, it's a little bit more, more, more lenient to us than actual programming languages. We could write some English stuff in it that wouldn't go in the actual programming language. So here's why I want to implement this function, f of n. I'm going to say if n is, say, 0, return 0. If n equal 1, return 1. I'm assuming here that return kills the function completely. So once I return, the, uh, the what's after it, it won't execute, right? So if I get here, it means I did not return, right? Yes. Which means n not 0 or 1. So I'm going to say return 1. I'm going to call recursively my function, right? Like literally like a recursive call, a function that calls itself. I'm going to say return f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus uh, 2. Right? Is that done? I usually put a bracket to indicate the scope. Could be a for loop, a while loop, or a function in this case. Would this return the right Fibonacci number? This program here? Yes. Sure. How many people are familiar with recursive calls? Functions that calls themselves. I don't mean in a particular language, I just mean in general. Right? Okay? So what's up with this program? Is it a good program? Bad program? No. no Why is it bad? It does a lot of calls. It wasted a lot of computing because you can repeat. It's not efficient. So let's actually look at the structures of those calls. So this is my pseudo code, but now I wanna I wanna see uh, 
in this particular recursive call. So what is, I'm going to call here the structure of calls. This structure in computer science has a name. We have a, when functions start calling each other, even recursively, how do we call that, that, how do we call that, that set of calls in memory? Stack. Stack. Stack of calls. Very good. So this is how this starts. Uh, this is a representation that's for me. It's now what happens in computer memory. Computer memory is managed by the operating system, by the compiler, uh, in how to manage the stack, of course. But as a representation, I'm going to say, if somebody wants to start with F100, that's my initial call. I have to compute N100. This function is going to call who? I'm going to call F of 99. And? How about this one? It's going to call f of 98 and 97. And this one's going to call? And this one's going to call two things and two things and two things and two things. Right? And they're going to keep calling. And um, what's going to happen? How big is this branch here? Just this the left branch. It's going to go all the way to where? F of? One, because at f of one, they don't keep calling. f of one returns immediately. How long is this branch here? N or 100 in this case. How about this right branch? That would end up with f of 96. The next one is 94. What's the last one? f of zero, which is going to return immediately. So I think this tree looks kind of like that. This, this length here is, is about n, and this length here is about n by, n by 2. So kind of the farther you go to the right, the shorter the branches are. But still, even by n by 2, even if the whole tree will be just n by 2 depth, which is clearly bigger than that, but even if I have just this, that will be a huge tree, right? For n equal 100, this is 50. If I do a binary tree, this is a tree here, right? Do we know this is a tree? Yeah. Yeah. If, I, if I do it 50, I advance 50 times. How big is going to be the number of leaves or nodes? In a binary tree, every time I advance, how many nodes do I get? Two. Double, right? So 2 to the 50 is a very big number, right? 2 to the 10 is roughly, say, a 1,000. So 2 to the 50, how big is 2 to the 50? It's 2 to the 10, everything to the 5th, right? So let's say 2 to the 10 is approximately a 1,000. It's not a 1,000. How much is it? OK, but a 1,000 to the 5th is what? How many zeros are in a 1,000 to the 5th? One zero 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 big number, right? And uh, by the way, my tree is actually bigger than that, right? Because it has this left side, which is even bigger. So obviously, this is very bad stuff because it's huge stack of calls in memory, and it's repeating a lot of stuff, a lot of computation is repeated, right? Look at f of uh, f of ninety seven is computed twice. And if I go to f of 94, it's probably computed six or seven times. So it's repeating the same thing. That is, well, it, it's nice mathematically because it's what you see is what you get. It's like Microsoft Word. Very nice. You don't have to know anything about editing because what you button you press, that's what happens on the screen, right? That's the same thing in here. See the math? See the code? Easy. What you see is what you get. This is very close to definition. That's the same problem as Microsoft Word. Not, not that, the results are not that good. Okay? Um, so, can you make it better? Uh, it's, instead of starting from N, you start from zero. And then you can you bottom up build this whole thing? Yeah. So, how, how do we do that? How do we, let's, let's do compute F of N. This is non recursive. 
How would I do that? So you first define f0 equals to 0. f0 equals 0. F zero. So actually, let's write that pseudo code. If, or how, how do I do? f, f of 0 is 0. That, that's an array notation, by the way. Yeah. When I put these square brackets, I mean array. Okay. What's the, finish, the difference between array and list? Array. array is a continuous chunk of memory. I know where it begins, I know where it ends, and I know each object, how many bytes it has. So in an array, I can easily jump to the fifth element, because if every element uses 10 bytes, I know to jump on 50 bytes. I know what that is in memory. It's a continuous chunk of memory. Lists are not continuous chunks of memory. This is in some part of memory, this is a different part of memory. But an array, continuous chunk of memory. I'm counting that you guys know this kind of stuff from undergraduate education. Uh, f of 1 equals 1. Now, not all programming languages allows me to do f of 0 equals 0. Like some uh, MATLAB, for example, starts from 1. You can't do this. But in pseudocode, we don't care about those small things. Like no homework or exam, you'll get penalized for f of 0 being 0 uh, independent of the programming language. When you write code, you have to be aware of what language you're using. And then I do what? A for loop. For loop. For i equal to, two, 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 to n. n, do what? f i equals to f of i is f of i minus, I minus one, one plus f of i minus two. I minus two. Mm -hmm. Is that, I'm gonna close the for loop. Some people prefer to put here an end for, that's okay to write here end for, that indicates that you, you're done with the for loop. I prefer to put a bracket. Visually makes it easier for me to see, okay, the for is from here to here. And now I have to return something. F of, that's my function, right? Is that gonna compute f of n correctly? Yes. The first part to care about any program, if it is correct. No program that is wrong, produce the wrong answer, is interesting, no, no matter how fast it is. So the first thing of any program is it producing the correct answer. The second thing we care about is how long does it take? Is, is this faster than this? A lot faster. What is the runtime in here? Runtime is linear. Because it, 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 it goes linear in n. Let me write it this way. <laughs> the number of steps that it does depends on n. If n equal 100, it's probably going to do around 100 <coughs> steps. If n equal 10,000, it's going to do 10,000 steps. The runtime in here is exponential. exponential of n. I'm loose in here, but by by. Friday, we're not going to be loose anymore. We're going to know exactly what exponential means and what linear means. But for now, let's just say if n is 10, that's some power like 2 to the 10. And if n is 100, that's a power 2 to the 100. That's an exponential, roughly, kind of thinking. And in linear, the difference between 100 and 10,000 is not that much for I do 100 steps or 10,000 steps. Now, 10,000 is bigger, but still for a computer, will will We'll, we'll compute this up to 10,000 in a fraction of a second. Well, this will never finish, right? If I, if I start with 10,000 here, no computer in the world will finish this computation. But in here, any cell phone will finish this immediately, up to 10,000. Who's with me so far? Good. Okay, so that's a lot better, right? Hmm. Is there a, way, a better way to do this? Is, that, is this the fastest way to do it? I mean, it's certainly, when you get to linear running times, that's good, that, that's, uh, that's pretty acceptable. In most cases, linear means good. Now, on big, big data sets, people want to go sublinear if possible, and some things can go a lot sublinear, like binary search is what? Logarithmic. Logarithmic is a lot less than linear. But what about particular Fibonacci numbers? I think there's a formula. formula. There's a yeah. formula, yeah. right? But we, it's hard to remember, right? One plus, one plus uh, square root five, mm -hmm. something. Yeah. So suppose I give you guys a quiz right now, like the first exam of the course, day one. I say, what's the formula? What do you do? 
<laughs> but in exams in this class, we, we won't use computers and we all fashion. No computers, tablets or laptops would be allowed during the exam. So how do we solve that problem? Suppose there is a formula, right? Because we remember, hey, I, I seem to somewhere, somehow, seen this before. Or somebody smarter than me knew the formula, right? So how they know it? <laughs> My guess is that this, what, what was the 1.6? Your 1.6 is what? Um, I mean, if you multiply, after a certain point, if you multiply with each element by 1.6, you get very close to the next, uh, next digit in the sequence. So by what he's saying, he remembers that's 1.6 or approximately, right? Maybe it's not exactly 1.6, yeah. right? That if I multiply a current Fibonacci numbers after a while, not, not the very beginning, but after a while with 1.6, roughly I get the next one. And then I multiply again with 1.6, I get the next one. So if that's true, as an intuition, common sense, it means after a while, what kind of formula should we expect if every number is the previous one multiplied with 1.6? Or with some value that we don't know. What, what does that mean? Long term. It's going to be like a what? Like a polynomial? Like a linear function? Quadratic? What, what kind of function do we expect? Hmm? Geometric? Geometric? So what, what, kind of, what kind of numbers have this sort of property? That let's assume that after a while, I get uh, some f. f uh, let's call it f t. And then f t plus 1 is ft multiply I don't want to say 1.6 I want to I want to fix a constant like he's assuming there's a constant I'm going to call it phi like this let's say that's approximately 1.6 that, that's what he says this is times phi right mm -hmm. then the next one ft plus 2 it's approximately mm -hmm. the same ft because ft I started some more times p square. square then the next one it's approximately p cube, right? Mm -hmm. What kind of numbers have this property? Yeah. That the se yeah. It's called a sequence or yeah. series. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Right. That's an exponential function, right? Exponential functions have this property. You can call it geometric. That the next value, take 2 to the n. 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, to the 3, to the 4. What happened between 1 and the next one? Yeah. Multiply by 2. Take 5 to the n. What happens between one number and the next one? Multiply by 5, right? So exponential functions or geometric functions have this property specifically. So let's say exponential or geometric have the property that the next value is the previous value times a constant. That's an intuition. Now, I didn't say this. Don't blame me. He did. Okay? So let's... And we don't know what the constant is. Maybe it's 1.6. And we don't know if this is true. This is what I remember from before. Who knows if I remember correctly. Right? But let's keep going with this intuition. See where it takes us. If f of n is to be exactly some phi to the n, exactly... Uh, that would imply, right, that what's the Fibonacci formula? There is a recurrence here, right? Mm -hmm. Right? So how would I write that recurrence now that I, I'm assuming that Fibonacci is roughly this to some power? Well, that would mean, how do I write the recurrence? Who's Fn plus 1? Phi at n plus 1 must be phi of n plus right? If this is to be an exponential function of this form and is to satisfy this relationship all the way down to very large ends, it means phi has to satisfy this relation. Well, I can divide with a small power here, right, the whole thing, and I get what? Phi squared square equal? Phi plus one. Phi plus one. That's a quadratic equation I can solve. Mm -hmm. right? This equation x squared equal x plus 1. Actually, minus x minus 1 equals 0. Right? Has two roots. Right? And one of them is, let's see here, 
here. Uh, I, if we don't know how to solve quadratic equations, uh, we can do the following thing. x squared minus, um, two, here's what I have here. 2, 1, 2, x plus 1 fourth minus 5 fourth. Is that, is that correct? Equals 0? It's the same thing, right? x squared minus x minus 1, right? Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to group this whole thing together. I'm going to say that is x minus 1 half square equal 5 by 4. Is that, is that correct? Is that equal that? x squared is here. 1 half squared is 1 fourth. Yeah. And What's the remaining term? 2ab, mi minus 2ab, right? a squared, b squared, minus 2ab. That is 2 times 1 half times x. That's this guy here. Right? And I move 5 fourths on the other side of the equal sign. So that means, of course, now that x has to be uh, its other plus minus square root of 5 over 4, right? <coughs> plus 1 half. Right, because when I take the square root, I get either the positive or the negative of the thing, but then I have to move the one half on the other side. So this means two two um, roots. The two roots are um, let me see one plus the square root of five by two. And uh, 1 minus square root of 5 by 2. Is that correct? Yes. We're going to call this phi. That's our phi. I think that's about 1.6, 1.61 or something like that. And we're going to call this C, another Greek letter. Fun to write. Do we all follow what happened here? I just follow that intuition that says if this is to be an exponential function, because that's what somebody says, it has to satisfy this relation. I'm solving that equation, and I'm getting to this is the phi, and that's the c, that I, that's the side of the possibility. Now, of course, this guy is negative. Right? 1 minus square root of 5. This is number smaller than 0. Um, and so I'm counting on this phi to do most of the lifting in an exponential sense. If, 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 if this is an exponential function, it means it's going to grow very fast. So it's going to be the phi that drives the, the growth. So here's a... A uh, little theorem here. That I could, you guys can work this out from the beginning of the recurrence, the F0, F1, F2. Um, theorem F of n is P at n minus C at n divided by P minus C. That is this 1.6 at n minus this at n divide by their difference. Now this C it's a number between how much is C approximately? One minus square root of five is what? One point seven. So one minus one point seven divide by two point minus point three five. Minus 0.35, it's a number between 0 and 1 in absolute value, which means if I raise it at a power, it's going to very quickly go to 0. So this term is insignificant in terms of growth, right? So as a growth will be approximately only phi of n divided by phi minus c. Because, again, this number that you said it's how much? Minus 3, minus 0 0.35? Uh, yes, it's minus minus 0 0.5. How much? Minus 0 0.5. Let's do it again. So how much is the square root of 5? Uh, we miss that. It's 2.7, right? So 1 minus 2.7 is? Minus 1.7. Right. Divide by 2? Uh, 0.7. Okay. So that's still between 0 and 1, which means if I start raising at a power, any number smaller than one, raised at a big power, it's going to get, get to zero quickly. So it will be an insignificant value, this big C of n. So the growth is roughly that. 
Okay, but let's prove our theorem. How do we prove such a theorem? This has to be true for every n. What's the proving technique that allows to do such a thing? Induction. Induction. Yeah. How do we do proof by induction? Base case. Let's see. F0 is, in, when you do the base cases, you plug in directly without thinking the stuff, and then you check it later. So that's supposed to be P at 0 minus C at 0 divided by phi minus C. How much is this? Zero. This is one, one, this is zero. Is that true? F of z F zero is zero? Yeah. Yes. Okay, how about the next base case, F of one? It's phi at one minus c at one divided by phi minus c. That's one. This is phi minus c divided by phi minus one. c. That's one. Good. So that's no problem. We've got those base cases. Now the induction step. Induction step, before you prove it, you have to state it, always. Induction step, you have to say, I'm proving from here to here. So in our case, will be what? The induction step will be if Fn is phi of n minus c of n divided by phi minus c, and Fn minus 1 is phi of n uh, minus, minus 1 c n minus 1 divided by phi minus c, then we're going to prove what? Fn plus 1 is phi n plus 1 minus c n plus 1 divided by phi minus c. So remember, in an induction step proof, you have to first state what it is that you want to prove. No matter how obvious it looks, strong induction, weak induction, whatever, you have to state, I'm assuming that if those two things are true, that's the stuff that I'm going to prove next. Do we all know induction a little bit? Hands up. Who remembers induction? You can be honest. So hands up who's remembering induction. Induction is something we're going to need. So I have some notes and some tutorials from the undergraduate level classes. There's no shame in saying, I don't remember how that goes. Go and check a little bit how induction goes. No problem, OK? But, but that's going to happen uh, sooner or later, actually next week. We're going to need the induction. So it, this is a strong induction step, because it uses not just the previous one, but it uses more than the previous one. Right? It's not a proof. This is just a statement. I want to prove this. Right? So how do I do the proof now? I look at that fm plus 1 and say, what do I know about fm plus 1? It's fm plus 1. Right? And now, I can use this stuff. That's the whole point of an induction proof, that during the proof, I'm using the, the, the stuff inductively I know from before. So I can replace fn with this thing here. Right? So what am I going to get? I'm going to get fn minus c n divided by phi minus c, right? Plus the other one, fn minus 1, I'm going to use this formula right here. phi n minus 1 minus c n minus 1 divided by phi minus c, right? So this is, I'm going to group the phi's together. They have the same denominator here, right? So I'm going to group the phi's together. I'm going to get phi n plus phi n minus 1 in one, one chunk. Minus, I'm going to group now the c's together. Let me see if I can fit it here. C n plus c n minus 1. So it's a plus because they're minus, minus, but I have the minus in front of the parentheses divided by phi minus c. So now, what happens? Who is phi of n plus phi of n minus 1? What do we know about phi? Phi of n plus phi of n minus 1 is phi of n plus 1. So this is phi of n plus 1 minus. How about the c's? 
the Cs satisfy the same equation, right? Phi or Xi satisfy this equation. So whatever was true for phi, C will satisfy the same thing. C squared will be C plus 1, which is the same as saying C at n plus 1 is C at n plus C at n minus 1, right? Because C and phi were the roots of the same equation, they both have to satisfy that, that relation. So C of n plus C of n minus 1 has got to be C of n plus 1 divided by phi minus C. That proves what I wanted to prove, right? That is, this is the Fibonacci formula right here because I prove it now by induction. So, of course, that's a very fast thing to do. Right? Uh, how fast is to compute this? If you really plug into a processor, what, what you really have to do here? Just one. What's the, uh, what's the slow operation here? In computing, this fee is a number. Exponential. The exponential, right? How fast CPUs do exponentials? By the way, that's a tricky question. I'm warning you right now. How fast a CPU does an exponentiation? Really? If I plug in like a million, it's going to raise something at a million in constant time? That's something for you. It's not related to this class algorithm. It's more related to computer uh, architectures and stuff. Just 10 or 15 years ago, some operations in the CPU were still very slow compared to other operations. Additions and subtractions were fast from the very beginning, but things like divisions and um, exponentiations were not that fast. Intel, in particular, has made a lot of progress in adding, I don't know if you've seen, every year there's a, for, uh, now it's stuck, but for uh, quite a while, the last 10 years, there's a new set of instructions coming out because they, impl they implemented faster and faster and faster some of these basic operations, like logarithms used to take a long time. Um, uh, if, you, if you remember uh, when the game, uh, what was it, Doom came out or Quake, one of these? At it reverse was, square root. It was, it was, it was uh, built not as just a fun game, but as a breakthrough in computing a certain function that was simple, but 3D games were using it a lot. What was that function, do you know? Reverse square root. Inverse square root. Inverse. How to compute one over square root of x. That's necessary for rendering polygons, and Doom and Quake, they have a lot of polygons to render. And doing this very fast was key at that time to get a good frame rate per second, because you have to render a lot of polygons. This was a slow operation just 10, 15 years ago. So the person who, who made this breakthrough figured out a quick algorithm based on calculus. I can put a note if you want to see how he did it. Some combination of Newton or Meton optimization and some random guessing to compute this faster than if you just ask the CPU, take the square root and do the inverse. Both these operations were hard. Take the square root and one divided by that number were, were slow operations. In the meantime, Intel figured out how to do this much faster than this algorithm did 15 years ago. So now if you implement a game that renders polygon with a video card, you, you don't need to worry about this. You just, uh, they, they'll do it for you fast enough. But certain operations, like again, like exponentiation is that category. Um, you can assume for practical purposes today, it's almost constant time. It was not always so. An addition was always constant time. An exponentiation is a tricky operation and involves some fancy mathematics to do it fast. But how would you do an exponentiation by hand? Suppose you do want to raise a number at a big power. Let's take an example here. Uh, the base doesn't matter. Suppose I want to compute Say I want to do 2 out of 100. There's a naive way. 
two times two times two times two hundred times. Right? Uh, I'm not worried about the size of the number, so this is not a tricky question in the sense of, okay, 2 out of 100 is too big of a number, I have no place to store it. I'm just asking procedurally, in terms of number of multiplications, because multiplication is a very, very expensive operation compared to, say, addition. How would you do this faster than, how many multiplications are here? 99, say roughly 100. Can you do it faster? Can you divide them into half? What? Divide them into 2 raised to 5 10, and then multiply 5 or 10 times. So I divide in here, yeah. and then I divide, keep dividing. Yeah. Okay. Into sub I think I can do that. How long is that going to take? Long. Long. Roughly long. long. Uh, and that's okay. That's a good method. The one I have in mind is to think of 2 at 100 as 2 at... Yeah. I'm going to break 100 into interesting numbers. Here's my number. 64 times 32 times what? Four. Now, any number can be broken into these kind of interesting numbers, which are powers of two, right? Any number. A hundred happens to be 64 plus 32 plus four, but any number can be in that way. And by the way, to get the powers of two that fit in a number, in this case, two to the six, two to the five and two to the two. That's very easy because those numbers correspond to what in binary? Who's a hundred in binary? The first bit in here at the right is? Zero, zero, because those are the, then one, that's this bit. Then, zero, one. This is for eight and for 16. Then I get a 1 for 32 and a 1 for 64, right? So in binary, if you look at the number in binary, it's very easy to see the powers of 2 because the powers of 2 correspond to the 1 bits immediately, right? Which for computers, natural, all computers represent things is this way. So they don't have to worry about what's 100 in binary because then they have it in binary already. So if I do it, if I think of 100 that way, how do I... Do this fast. 164 and uh, zeros. So I think the way to do it fast is to start with two. Uh, procedurally, I think you mean how to multiply by two in a bitwise sense. Mm -hmm. He's saying that multiplying by two is pushing everything to the left by one position. Mm -hmm. But but as a, as conceptually, the the way I, I get rid of the multiplications is to say, I get 2, I get 2 at 2, of course it's 2 times 2, then I get 2 at 4, which is 2 at 2 times 2 at 2, then I get 2 at 8, which is 2 times 4 times 2 times 4, then I get 2 at 16, which is 2 times 8, 2 times 8, and then I get 2 at 32, which is 2 at 16 times 2 at 16, so now that I've got all the powers I need, I actually don't need all of them, but I, I need an intermediary power. Like 2 to the 8, I don't need in there, but I need it to keep going. So which are the ones I need? 32, 16, and 4. So I have to multiply those together, right, to get my answer. So the, I have to do this. So how many multiplications I did total in here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Six, seven. Okay, so this is seven multiplication. It, this procedure is called fast exponentiation. By squaring, repeated squaring. That is, don't multiply 2 or whatever base you have with itself 100 times. Raise it, square it, and square it, and square it, and obtain all these powers. Go as far as you need to go. And when, when you have all the powers, use only the ones you need. 
to do the product. How many people follow me here? All right. This is typical undergraduate material. I think most of you have seen fast exponentiation during either a math course or an algorithms course before. Well, I want to go back to something he said. He said, okay, that's very good. I think he, he, he has a comment because I choose two as a base. What he said wouldn't work if I choose 1.6 or 7 as a base. But in particular, for 2 as a base, it's even faster to do multiplications for a computer, right? Because I don't actually have to do a multiplication if my base is 2. See? Any number, take this number. How do I multiply it by 2? I left it by one position. How do I divide it by 2? <coughs> right by one position, I move all the bits, right? Imagine if I, if this is the cutoff, like the saw, I have a saw here, and if I move, I push everything, cuts one zero, that's division by two, right? That's very important to know, because it relates to how numbers get represented in base two, right? If this is two, two to the six, uh, plus two to the five, plus two to the two, Right? What happens effectively when we move to the right by one bit? When I, if I take this zero out and I read that again, every single power will go down by one, right? That's division by two. And what happens when I move all the bits to the left? Every single power increases by one. That's multiplying by two. So that's extremely useful for computers because that's much faster than actually doing a multiplication with 7 or 1.6 or whatever. Shifting the bits is as, as fast as doing an addition for a computer. All right? Um, so now, the last thing I want to do here before I show you, I go to the, some ad, little administrative stuff. I want to show you something with Fibonacci numbers. Um, That is, from a computer science perspective, how could I have uh, thought of that problem? <laughs> so here's a computer science problem that doesn't mention Fibonacci numbers. It just states something that you have to do. It says, um, If I have a sequence of n bits, here's the bit. Of course, these guys being bits, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 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 eight. Um, the values could be zero or one, right? Because they're bits. So every value here, b, has to be either 0 or 1. Um, I want the, the possible sequences. So I want the number 1. That's the task. Number of sequences. Uh, that do not have consecutive ones. So in other words, what's up with this sequence? Zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one. Is that allowed? Yes. How about one, one, one here? Not allowed, right? So the problem is asking how many sequences are there on a fixed number of bits? So n is fixed, n is an input. It could be 8 in my case. Maybe you get 16 or 24 or 22. You're given an n. And I'm asked how many sequences of n bits have the property that two consecutive ones cannot be together.
So if I wanted to do a quiz day one to see who, who, who how you guys do, I could have had this problem, right? Write a program. You get n as an input, of course. Write a program that calculates how many bits, how many sequences of bits have this property. First of all, without the property, how many sequences of bits are there? When I say sequence, does the order matter? If I take this one and zero and I flip them, is the same sequence or a different sequence? Because the sequence, when I say sequence, the order matters. If I say set or just the number of ones count, how many ones do I have in a sequence, it's all that matters, then flipping a zero or one doesn't change the count. But in a sequence, changing, how about changing those two zeros, will change the sequence or not? No, that's the same sequence, right? So how many, if I don't put this condition, how many possible sequences are there? Hmm? How many? Two to the n? Total sequences? Is that true? N factorial? Counting is a fundamental operation not just for computer science. Just day by day life. A enormous ability to know how to count things. I, I could you could say there are two kinds of people, the ones who can count and the ones who cannot count. So uh, you gotta be obviously able to count. Is it two to the n or n factorial or what is it? Two to the n. Why? Every bit has two options, zero or one. Every bit has two options, zero or one, and all the options go with every other option. Right? That, that's called like the product rule, if you remember from, from high school. If I have three pants, two shirts, and four hats, in how many ways can I dress up? Two times three times four, because I can put any pant with any shirt with any hat. That's why it makes it the product rule. Every combination is valid. That's the same thing with those bits. Everyone in here, this one can be zero or one. And for every possibility from the first position, there's a zero, one here, two possibilities. This is the number of pants, shirts, hats, ties, shoes, so on and so forth, right? Every combination goes, so it's two times two times two times two times two, two to the end. Let's erase this. <coughs> two to the end. That, of course, the problem is more interesting than that. Not all of these two to the end sequences are valid because some of them will contain ones next to each other, consecutive, and that's not allowed. So how many are valid? How would you solve this problem? You get this as an interview, your first question. Get your dream job ready, and the interviewer said, ha, huh, compute the number of sequences that don't have consecutive ones, what do you do? Yes? So he's, I think, proposing saying, if I know how many are total, I could count the invalid ones somehow, yeah. not the valid ones, the invalid ones, count how many sequences have consecutive ones, and then take them out of the total. That, of course, works, but you still have to count the invalid ones. How many sequences have two consecutive or more ones together. It's not, it doesn't seem to me an easier problem. Seems the same kind of difficulty. I would agree definitely that if you can count the invalid ones, take the total minus invalid, you get the valid ones. Sure, we can all agree that that's true. Well, how many invalid ones are there then? Half? Hmm? Half? 2 squared minus 27. Yeah. What is it? 27? 2 squared minus 27. 2? Say so again, I don't know. 2 is to 8. 8. Minus. No. Minus down? Yeah. 7 like that? 27. 27. Yeah. I think you, you just said you count the invalid ones. That's what he, he was saying behind you. 2 to the 8 is the total number, assuming n equal 8, right? 2 to the n is 2 to the 8, so that's all the sequences. Can you guys 
here. Level. And I think you counted some of the invalid ones, right? Right? And you got 27 by hand. What if n is not 8, it's 10? You have to do it for every n, right? So this 27, I don't know, maybe, maybe the number of invalid sequences for n equal 8, but what about n equal 9 or 10? How this, you have to write a program that works for every n, not just for one n, right? Yes. Can we place uh, zeros at every alternate block and then calculate the uh, alternate zero. block? Yes. Like uh, for example, we have uh, eight blocks here, right? So for eight, eight bits. Eight, eight bits. bits. Yes. Let's not call it blocks if they bits. Okay. Bits. So, so I put a zero. Uh, yes. Then uh, in the th at the third bit, a zero again. Third bit. You want to make sure this is a zero. Yes. But it's not always a zero. Like this here is a valid sequence, uh, right? No, but uh, in a in a valid uh, sequence where uh, there are no consecutive ones, uh, that will be zero, right? Not necessarily. It's, it's one here, right? And it's a valid sequence. Uh, no, but the possibilities that we have to find uh, in which uh, there are no consecutive ones, if we place zero that uh, of one, three, five, seven, bit. Yeah. So you, what you're saying, I think, is here's my sequence, and it has say eight, right? You say this got to be a zero, yes. this got to be a zero, yes. this got to be a zero. Yes. There's one, uh, one more bit. There's one more bit here. This got to be a zero. Yes. Uh -huh. And then we find the possibilities for others. And there's one more sequence where... Uh, but that's not necessary. This can be a one. Right? So, uh, what he is saying is, this is one of the cases. In another case, we will take the even places as zeros. So they will so, be two... Uh, you say it's either like that or... Yes. or yes. I see. It's yeah. got to look like that. Yes. And then we add the possibilities of both of them. But is that true? Mm -hmm. Any valid, he's making a speculation here. We, we, we nice in mathematics, we don't call it speculation. That, that's, we call it in economy. In mathematics, we call it assumption, hypothesis, right? But it's really a speculation, right? He's saying any valid sequence looks either like this or like that. Is it true or false? False. 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 Yes. There are sequences that don't look like this, and they're valid. You can think more about it. But that's the right way to start approaching it, right? I mean, trial and error is necessary. No matter what people tell you, you need a little bit of trial and error to figure out what, what is it you're going to do. So this is the right way, but I don't think those are the only two possibilities for valid sequences. Yes? If there is n bits, the maximum number of ones can be n by 2, and the minimum can be 0. So we'll find all the combinations for... But n. how do we find all the combinations? So by combination logic, n factorial thing. Remember, we, the, pro, the, the problem doesn't ask you to list all possibilities. What the problems ask you? How many? So we don't have to print all the valid possibilities. We just have to output a number. 375,865. Okay? We, we don't need to list all the combinations. So how do we count the valid ones? So we will assume there is no one, so there will be only one sequence. And with only one, it will be n times. And mm. some. I don't know. That feels a little fishy to me. <laughs> but maybe you can try it out. Maybe, uh, maybe we can first, first we have the base case that all zeros. So that's one case. Then we just count for one, one. You let's put add one in it. Yes. Obviously, you can add around any, anywhere yeah, you want. Then, That's not going to cause trouble. Just, let's just add one, one, and then count. If we have a, that that will be that, that can fix in n positions. Yep. So that's n. When we add two ones, then we fix one first one at the first position, and then we have n minus two positions for the second one. Similarly, we go for three, so we'll get one plus n plus n minus except, two. Except except there's a corner case when the first one is in here, but that's the second there. one is n minus two spots. Yes. Allowed, but when this one is in here, how many but spots I have for the uh, second one? That will be covered in the in that in that uh, if we if you're fixing that one here, uh, in the first position, and we are taking it for n minus two. Uh, so you're saying two ones, right? Yes. With two ones, if one if the most left one is in here, how many possibilities for the second one do I have? N minus two. N minus two because it, this one is blocked, yes. and this one is 
already taken. But what if the first, the left, most left one is not at the extreme? Suppose the le most left one is here. How many options I have now? Yeah. But I think it's a little. But we, can we, can iterate, we can take an iterative approach, like taking one one, then two ones. I think maybe that can be made to work, but you're still writing a program. It's not going to be a trivial exercise. I don't think you can write a program like that right now. I think you need a few hours to make sure it works. Perhaps that thing works. Yes? Maybe we can consider a combination of two ones as a single entity and consider that as one bit and then we are left with just six of them and then find the combination. And then do it with two of them, then do it with three of them. I think that's similar. You still have to write the program that correctly does this. Anybody has any ideas in the back? Because those guys are in here and they like to talk a lot. I want to give the back a chance to. How do I compute the number of sequences that have this property? Yes. Can we start with a small number like n equals 1 and n equals 2 and find the pattern? Yeah. You implying that if what he's saying, if I can see this for n equal one, count them manually, for n equal two, n equal three, n equal four, maybe I get some sort of numbers that looks to me maybe quadratic or exponential or something, and it gives me that's called a guess. By doing it manually for the base cases, right? He's saying maybe something strikes me, inspiration. And, and I get a good guess, right? Because if I see 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, I'm going to guess it's n squared, right? I think that's another good trial, trial and error, right? Try the base case and see maybe you, you, you get some sort of guess how, by, by the, how it looks. Yes? Size equals n, the number of possibilities is 2 to n. So if we take the first one as 1 or 0, then which first one? Which hold on, hold on. So I uh, let me see what you mean. You saying I have I have this set of n bits, right? So you take two possibilities, either one or zero here. Okay. So he is thinking the first option it's either one or zero. Right? Then one. Then no more possibility for the rest of the array to h to n minus one. So how many ways can I do this valid? Right? So let's say here, when I put this number, in me, this sign means what? Count. Number of. So he wants to count those possibilities that start with a 1, and also count those possibilities that start with a 0, right? And you know how to do this? Because of the... It depends a lot on the first. Yeah, the first those two ideas yeah. solve the problem. Break it into two, this is called these joint possibilities. Where, if you remember from high school or college, depending on what part of the world you've been, these joint possibilities add up. Because there's nothing that can be this way and that way. They have no intersection. All the valid possibilities are either here or here. So I didn't miss anything. and. No valid possibility can start in the same time simultaneously with 1 and 0. So I have no intersection. The rule that applies, it's called the sum rule. That means if you count those ones and those ones, you can just add them up. This is the most powerful computer science method, aka divide and conquer. I'm doing my problem, which is a counting problem in this case. I'm breaking it up into smaller problems, but not at random, in a way that's easy for me to take the answers and combine them. See, he knows that if I count this correct and this correct, all I have to do is add them up at the end. Again, why? No valid possibility will be missed. It's either starting with one or zero. And no valid possibility will be counted twice. No possibilities here and here. That's why those are kind of disjoint. Or sometimes you're going to hear partition and partition rule. In a partition rule, if you count, so we want to know how many Chinese students are in all four sections of CS5800. Can I count the ones in this section? 
plus the ones in the second section, plus the ones in the third section, plus the ones in the fourth section, add them up? Yes, because the sections form a partition of the Chinese students. Every Chinese student must be in one of the sections and in exactly one section. Nobody is in two sections, right? That makes the partition rule work. Breaking my problem into sub-problems, these are now simple problems. We'll see that why that is in a second. And if I manage to compute those somehow, I can just add it up. Right? Now, why they are simple problems? What makes them simpler? Common sense? Uh, so the next value basically depends on the left value. So if you have one, you cannot have another one. That's the... the what that's makes them simpler is I don't have n bits to play with anymore. Yeah, it's a restricted space. Way. Now I have less bits to play with. The number of valid possibilities, so to speak, mm -hmm. it's not choose anything you want on n bits. One bit is fixed, so you can only play with the other ones. Now I think he's coming into play that says, okay, you still cannot compute this like in a, in a closed form. It's not like you can now have an answer here, but you can build the recursion. You can build the answer, the total answer as what happens here plus what's happened there. And once you have a recursion, maybe mathematically you solve that recursion. And there is a third wrinkle, which is what you said. This one, I think is totally free, right? Once I have a zero, can I play freely with n minus one bits like I could have done in the beginning? But this is a little tricky, right? Yeah. So in this case, how many number of valid possibilities I have here? Let's call this function, uh, the answer is R of n, right? That's, that's how many sequences, valid sequences, R of n bits. How many number of valid here are? Right. This is R n minus 1 because 1 is fixed and I can do anything I want with n minus 1 bits as long as it's valid, like as long as two ones don't show up together, which is the exact definition of the problem from the beginning. So this is definitely R n minus 1. What about here? Can I just say this is R n minus 1? No. There is something that breaks it. If this is a 1, what's up to this next bit? Must be a 0. So the right way to break the problem, when you broke it, is not into one and zero. Is to say, it either starts with a zero and then whatever, valid, or it's a one zero and then whatever, valid. So now, what's the number of valid here? So what's the number of Rn partition rule? Uh-huh. Ain't that nice? So what do you think is the number of valid sequences? It's got to be Fibonacci numbers, right? I mean, we have to check the base cases. Is R0, 0? In fact, it's not exactly that. It's shifted by two positions. The right blah, blah, blah with n bits is the Fibonacci of n plus 2. But that's just, you figure that out from the base cases. This recurrence tells you right away, this got to be something like Fibonacci numbers, which is a recurrence we already know how to solve now, right? So we could have introduced Fibonacci numbers that way. We have to solve this problem. How do we solve it? Divide and conquer. It's very important when you break things, a problem into subproblem, which is going to happen a lot. Not just this term, a lot. The way computers solve problems is always to break them into subproblems. You need to do two things. First, figure out that you understand how the breaking works, this partition rule, the fact that you count everything correctly and not twice and then have a way to combine those results into what you need. In here it's very easy, just add them up. But sometimes it's not that easy. Sometimes you have to do search, once you solve the subproblems, search for minimum or maximum or check some property, there is a way to combine them. When you break into problems, you have to understand how the breakup works, what are the subproblems. In here the subproblems are not one and whatever, zero whatever, are zero whatever and one zero whatever. Those are the subproblems, And the combination is summing up the counts. Uh, merge sort works in the same way. A quick sort works in the same way. This is also called later on in the course dynamic programming, right? Another big area of study for us, right? Uh, so divide and conquer is going to be the bread and butter of what we do. Let me see if I can talk about 10 minutes about how this course is going to go administratively. 
So what we're going to be most worried again in this course is ability to think. Think, think, think. A lot of jacks in here. But not the one I need. There's one falling down. There's one down? Yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, you guys gonna have to bookmark this page. That's the only important thing that matters. Uh, so is there a way for me to, to help you out with that? Uh, text, edit. Let's try this. So we need to bookmark this page. That's where stuff is going to happen. That's our website. This is only for the sections. The sections, this term, are not synchronized. Uh, we have the same core material, the same curriculum, but it's up to every instructor to decide an order, homeworks, assignments, evaluation, grades. Uh, exams, so on and so forth, they will not be synchronized. Your exam will not be the same as the other people's exams or your homeworks. Uh, that is, we do try to get the same curve of grades, uh, curving at the very end of the term. So the percentage of A's in this class, this section, will be roughly the same percentage as the other sections. We, we don't want to make a section a lot easier or a lot harder simply because the exam or simply because the homeworks and stuff like that. So if you're worried, okay, I'm in this section, would it be easier or harder to get an A? Percentage-wise, at least, it's typically the same. It's about 35% A's and 35% B's and the C's and D's and so on and so forth. But this is a typical standard curve that the university uses, and it's usually more or less consistent across sections. Now, assuming we've got this right, did we get it? This is our course. So uh, what do we have here? We have uh, a piazza, I think. I, I'm assuming you're familiar with piazza. <laughs> Nothing there interesting to say. You just have to join as a student. You ask questions. Uh, other students are, are, are answering. We answer them. You know, it's a discussion forum. Um, I'm, I'm also asking you guys to create, in terms of submissions, uh, if you use Dropbox, that's great. If you don't, it's extremely easy to set up and it's free. Um, you're going to create a folder that has to be named CS1800, your name, your last name. And in that folder, you're going to store homework one, homework two, homework three. And you, I want you to share that folder with this email address, Dropbox. Okay, that's where the TAs will see your homework. You share it not as a link but as an editable, workable, collaborative folder. And the TAs will see everything you do in that folder. It's okay to put your scraps, like you don't worry, you know, just put the pristine versions of the homework, not what I worked before. If you, if you put anything that you don't want TAs to see, you can delete it or you can leave it there. As long as it's clear, uh, homework two, problem three is that file. Typically, we ask for a PDF file uh, that's where the TAs will grade it. They're going to see it, and uh, assuming it's in time, before the deadline, so on and so forth, they're going to give you a grade, and they may annotate it. If you do something wrong, they might put a red mark on it. Everything will happen to this uh, Dropbox. 
that's up to the TAs, by the way. If uh, we're still figuring out the TAs, uh, if, if, if a TA says, for example, I would prefer papers, then I will leave them to get papers. So they will talk to you. Submissions is completely up to them. If they prefer papers, they can print it from Dropbox, or maybe you can give them a paper. I, I think they'll prefer Dropbox. It's a lot easier than moving stacks of papers around. The papers not going to be that small. Homeworks are going to be, you know, an interesting stack of things. So, so I think <laughs> doing by Dropbox saves us of all that paper moving around. Now, in terms of how you submit stuff, most people write it by hand. That's totally fine. You have to find a way to scan this hand, or or you can write it in LaTeX or whatever system you want. But if you write it by hand, we're totally fine with that. If it's if it's readable. There are many scanning programs now on cell phones. So uh, it's better to use a scanning program than to simply take pictures and put the pictures together. A scanning program deals with a lot of the mess of how the picture is taken. Some, most of them are free and also allow you to do multiple pages. You just picture, 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 picture. You say, I'm done. You have a PDF. And most of the scanning programs, if you have Dropbox on your phone, will allow you to directly save it into Dropbox. So it does the whole thing in a few seconds. You just take your, your paper that you wrote, duck, 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 press a button, it's on Dropbox already. Uh, homeworks have a deadline, of course. Um, uh, that means that's where you're supposed to finish your, your homework. Uh, so every edit after that date is considered late by an amount. Um, so homework one is already posted in here. Okay. That's homework one. Exercises are from the Corman's book. You're going to need access to that book. We're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, I'm not terribly lenient. I, I'm not very strict to the deadlines. So if you go to the schedule, it's you, you're going to see um, the homework right here. That's homework one. This is by week. So we are at week with where we just talk about Fibonacci and this, and next time we're going to talk about Strassen and matrix multiplications, right? So if you, typically the way this is organized, there's some notes or, or slides that you have to uh, see from here, right? Um, there is a video, that is this video that we're filming right now. When you click on this link, you're going to get to YouTube and see the video if you want to. Uh, I, I would say the most valuable thing in this class by far are the lectures. Out of the six thousand dollars you pay, or how much is it for a class? I would say ninety percent is the lecture. So skipping the lecture means you just wasted your money. All this stuff is, of course, on Wikipedia and online courses and all that. So you could ask legitimately, what's the point of spending six thousand dollars or some things that have been figured out thirty years ago, <laughs> right? Think the same from thirty years ago. Math that I showed you has been figured out 120 years ago. <laughs> so why would I pay $6,000 for all that? No, it's a very legitimate question. I would say in this class, CS 1800, lectures are what make it worth. If you don't need those lectures, if you could stay home, it means you shouldn't have taken the class. It means you already knew what you need to, to, to do. You didn't need to take it. So uh, we have the video, and I'm going to keep filming it because you may need to miss a lecture, you get sick or something, or you may want to recap something, you know, later on. So I'll keep the lectures, but uh, as opposed to other classes that we teach, most engineering data classes, skipping the lecture is no big deal for an assignment in those classes. But in here, as I said, I think the lectures are by far the most valuable thing. This kind of explanation, back and forth going, why is this and not like that, and this way and not that way. So that's, uh, that's going to be some reading from the book or from other places. And as we advance, we have more stuff. Very quickly, we, we are at intro. We're going to talk next week about recurrences. Then we talk about sorting for two weeks and median statistics and some theorems. Then we talk about greedy and dynamic programming problems. Uh, this is the f heaviest topic in the course, dynamic programming is the most sophisticated topic that's absolutely required. So if, if we fail at this, we fail the course. Other sophisticated topics we can be lenient about, but dynamic programming is an absolute must for this, for this course. And then Saturday, 2.24, we're going to have a midterm. The reason it's on Saturday is because it's open time. 
nominally, we say it's three hours. And whoever wants to finish after three hours can leave. But I think you'll stay more than three hours. <laughs> okay? So if I were you, I would book right now that Saturday and book the whole day. Like, I don't want to say until what time, because I, I don't insist. And some students, you'll see they're finishing three, four hours, and some others will stay. But if I were you, I wouldn't set a date with my girlfriend for 1 p.m. Because maybe I'm still in the exam, you know? <laughs> Just in case. Uh, the midterm is a little bit, uh, I wouldn't say difficult, but it, it's more involved than other exams you have because it's designed to be a little bit like an interview. So you're going to actually have to think of interesting things. It will not be enough to repeat something from class to just put it there, you know, mechanically. Meter problems are like interviews, require thinking. Now, they're not very hard. When you're going to see the solutions, you're going to be like, oh my god, I stayed eight hours for that thing, and he did it in half an hour, the whole thing. It's not that hard, but it requires thinking. Uh, homeworks. We're going to have homeworks um, almost every week or so, so there's about ten homeworks. The first one is going to be due. I, I, I don't have the due date. It might be due faster than that. This homework will only take two days to full days, so we don't really need a week and a half for it. I may change the, the date, but I'm not going to change the homework. You can click on it right now, start working on it. Uh, for these two, you need recurrences, so you're going to need next week. You can't do those two problems without recurrences, but you should be able to do problems one to four in about a day easily. This is all some math thingies, and uh, this is the problem to list we just talked about. This thing we list here, that was in here, you have to program it. May take that difference, like somebody said, take the difference and then find the intersection of the list. Uh, you can choose whatever programming language you like for that. Uh, there will be office hours. So if we go here, the office hours will happen probably Wednesdays, and if we need also Fridays. Uh, room 166 at WVH. Uh, we'll see if we need a bigger room depending how many of you need help. Typically in the beginning of the course for these simple exercises people don't need that much help. Um, that's where the TAs are going to be. TAs are going to help you a lot with grading. So you may have questions about the grading. Why do I lose points on that problem? Come to this hours, talk to the TA and see what happens. Now, as we move on about a month from now, you're going to have more conceptual questions about the material in class. So there will be more office hours related to, I'm stuck at that, I didn't understand it, can you say it to me again? We're going to be two exams, midterm and the final, and the exams will make most of your grade. So uh, can you cheat on the homeworks? Can you, can you look for these solutions? By the way, the book is right here. You're going to need access to this book. I'm not using this so much. This, I think, it's available online anyway. So if I say read something from here, I'm probably going to give you what to read. I wouldn't buy this book unless we, we need to. But this is going to be necessary. Every homework is going to have exercises from this book. This is a good reference book. Once you have it, you're going to go back to it probably forever. You know, you need, it's a book that's worth keeping in, in the shelf. Uh, now, I'm not going to tell you how to get it, <laughs> uh, because people have, everybody has their own methodology. I'm required to tell you, don't do illegal things, but I, I'll stop right there. I don't do illegal things. I won't check if you bought it or not. You don't have to show me your receipt. If you have it, it's good. Uh, make sure you get a third edition. The last thing I want to say, it's about those homeworks. Can you cheat by looking at solutions online for this problem? This is such a popular book. It's been translated in all languages on earth, and the solutions are very easily findable. Google, you know, immediately uh, check them out. I don't care too much if you cheat on the homeworks. Let me tell you why. Because homeworks will have very little impact to your grade. If you cheat on the homeworks, you're cheating yourselves. Because you're not going to. Homeworks are to give you practice for the exams where the actual grading happens. So if you cheat on the homeworks, you get the full grades on the homework. We're not gonna even bother to see if you cheat or not, okay? We're gonna give you the points. And that will be nothing compared to the fact that you're gonna do a whooper in the exam. And if you, if you screw up the midterm on the final, that's gonna have a big impact of your grade. So while we don't care about the cheating in the homeworks, cheating in the exam will be impossible. And uh, 
that's when we're going to see right away that you didn't actually do the homeworks. Okay? So I would not, I would not do that. If, if you don't have the practice of the homeworks for this, for this dynamic programming, sorting, so on and so forth, uh, the real impact is going to be in the exams. Any questions? All righty. So, uh, yes. Just one thing. Uh, as you said that the midterm and the final term require a lot of thinking, and we develop it by practice. So, what is the proper way we should follow that we can actually climb this up? What? What is the what? What is the most proper way? Like, what we should follow that it will develop that kind of I, I think doing the homeworks is the most obvious way. Now, if you have more time than these homeworks or more ability, some people are good at math and algorithms, they have a natural ability for that we can have some extra credit problems. In fact, even there, there's an extra credit math problems from an undergraduate level. If you finish this homework and you say, that was too easy for me, uh, you can click on these math problems and see what you think about them. Um, and I'm happy to provide more exercises. In fact, the CLRS book, Corman's book, has more exercises than those ones here. You can do some of those. And they have some with stars that are more difficult exercises. And there's other books that I can... I think the easiest way to do this is to solve algorithmic problems. There's an enormous mat, uh, amount of algorithmic problems on the internet. So you don't need a book for that. What I think is the biggest problem people have is that they don't have the patience to try out the problems and they look at the solution when it's so easy to find it. And that's where you lose it. Even if you do understand the solution, the real practice, the real learning, the real ability develops in trial and error, in bouncing your head towards the problem. That's where you get the why the problem is difficult, how to solve it, so on and so forth. Not when you find the solution. Like in here, we talked about these four people crossing the river. The back and forth to figure out what's going on is what's going to make you better at solving problems, not somebody telling you the answer. So practicing problems. Now this may take longer than programming exercise in other courses because you know algorithmic math problems may take a long time to figure out. It's not a straightforward thing. There's not an obvious solution. So people put between 10 hours a week. If they want just a C plus and they, they or they're very good. They don't care. Up to people who put 40 hours a week. They drop other classes because they feel like okay, I need to get this right now. I would say this makes a difference in computer scientists, people who understand how to solve problems and people who can just do web development because they don't understand how to solve any problem. <laughs> so uh, that's going to be a difference in your salary, you know? Are you a web developer or you can actually solve any problem? Right there. $50,000 difference in your salary. You yeah, so I was just thinking, so like in the first problem we did, you know, we stuck at 23. And maybe while doing assignments, we don't know actually what's the optimum. And you're not gonna know. So that's the thing. How do you how do you know you got it? There's that eventually we're gonna do some proofs. Proof that my method is optimal. Okay. Not not an easy thing to get by. I agree. But this is some part of the course. We need to develop that ability to know when we've got the optimum solution. Yes. I don't have yet a, an exact schema. But um, usually it's 80% based on the exams to, to talk about. So I would say the grades on homeworks have much more to do with the fact that you got it. Getting a good grade on homework is not going to be reflected in the grade exam other than if you could get good grades means you actually did the practice. Uh, so th that's, that's for you to know that you got it. The exams are for us to give you a grade at the end. Can you tell about some sort of concepts that we should brush up that we'll be using a lot? And so might... there's a little bit of background here. You need data structure registry lists. Programming, not so much. You're going to need very basic programming. I assume most people, if, if you can take courses like data science courses, you certainly need to program more than here. Uh, but you do need the basic uh, math, things like counting, uh, probabilities, and uh, imperatives way of thinking. Uh, I don't mean to say you need calculus, for example, or, or statistics. Uh, we're going to need matrix multiplication, stuff like that. But usually there's nothing that you cannot catch up. If you not remember matrix multiplication, you spend a day or two, you're going to remember it, assuming you've seen it before. I think the patience and the rigorousity of thinking, like we did an induction proof. You may need to brush up induction, but the 
the most difficult part is to have the patients to do it rigorously, to not skip the steps, to not be loose, you know. Oh, I think it's by induction. FM plus one is the, uh, that's, not, that's not it, right? You gotta, you gotta take the time to do it right, you know. I'd say the biggest ability in this class, which is a, more like a native ability, is to know when something's off. Somebody tells you something, what was it? Do, do like this, look at the zeros on even places and zero on odd places and that's it. The biggest thing that saves time in here is to say, look at this and say, I don't think that works. I, I think I can find a counterexample for it. Knowing when something, either your idea or somebody else's idea, doesn't seem right and why it's not right, that's the, the, the tricky ability to have, to, to know when a solution is likely wrong, it misses some cases. Yes? Yeah, because <laughs> I need to add 64. So there's eight multiplications. Make this an eight while we while we still filming. Eight. All right. I'll see you guys on Friday. I don't know if we're gonna start office hours this week because you need to. I think we're gonna start on Friday. The first office hours will be Friday. Let me stop the camera. Well, that's in the homework. So if you if you look at the homework, let me stop the camera.